I'd love to get started introducing our next speaker. Wasn't that a great opening? Did you all enjoy Dr. Rebecca Nadal? I mean, yes, she is a joy to work with. As she said, she really does work very hard to bring uh, joy to everyone around her, and um, her students just love her. So I think that's kind of what today is about. It, at, at the very uh, kernel of what we're trying to do is um, just to create that space where everybody can talk about their stories and themselves and kind of fill that up with with uh, where they are. And she does a great job of do bringing everybody in together. So I appreciate that. And now I'm going to introduce our next speaker who is Dr. Melissa Ramirez. She is Assistant Professor of Spanish at Adams State University in Alamosa, Colorado. Yes. Uh, I'm going to just summarize a little bit from her bio, but by the way, all of the speaker's bios are in your program, if you didn't notice that. Um, she has been teaching languages for over 20 years. She has a BA in English and Spanish, and Master's and PhD in Spanish, and also a Master's in teaching English um, to speakers of other languages. Uh, before she joined Adam State, she taught at various other institutions, and I got the chance to have dinner with her last night and learn that she is actually originally from Peru, and she has uh, been in, I think you said Idaho, Alabama, Florida, so, um, and California. So she's kind of experienced a lot of different cultures, and now she is working with students uh, from the San Luis Valley, and she's gonna talk a little bit more about that perspective. So I'd like to please help me in welcoming Dr. Rami Vitz. Buenos dias. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank uh, CSU Pueblo for inviting me to present today, also the Aslan Research Center, um, and also Rhonda, Charlene, Julie, for making this possible and for the invitation. Thank you very much. Uh, so the title of my presentation is Embracing Cultural Identity Through the Use of, of um, Spanish as a Heritage Language in the St. Louis Valley. So as Rhonda said, I teach at Adams State University and we have a lot of students who are heritage speakers or heritage learners of Spanish. And also we have a lot of people in the community who take some of our classes as we offer on top. Um, more about this towards the end of our presentation. Um, so I'm going to start by um, talking about identity and language. We know uh, Dr. Rubaganeira talked in depth about that, so I will be asking you also to think about this and to share um, with uh, the other participants and with me what you remember from her presentation. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the St. Louis Valley um, I was told some of you are from the valley too. Um, and the Spanish that is spoken in the valley and also what we're doing at Adams State University and also in the community in the valley, what we're doing to embrace that cultural identity through the use of Spanish as a heritage language. So what is identity? What defines who we are? So I want you to take a minute or two, please, to talk with somebody who's sitting next to you about this. In your own words, in three or four words, how could you describe identity and what defines who you are? So I'll give you one to two minutes to talk with someone about this and think I'll ask you to share. <laughs>
person from a different table about this question. So one minute, so please go to another table. Go see somebody in the What is identity? What defines Yes. 
So let me talk a little bit about the San Luis Valley for those of you who um, only know a little bit or maybe are not familiar with the valley. It's in south central Colorado. It's surrounded by the Sangre de Cristo Mountains to the east, Sawash Mountains to the north, San Juan Mountain to the west, and the Rio Grande Valley of northern New Mexico to the south. It's composed mainly of six counties, Alamosa, Conejos, Costilla, Mineral, Rio Grande, and Sawachi. Uh, main towns are Alamosa, Monte Vista, San Luis, Antonito, Fort Garland, um, South Fort Crescent, etc. According to the 2020 census, it has more than 46,000 people, of which close to 50% identify themselves as Hispanic. And of those people, the majority say they learn and they either speak the Spanish language at home or they learn um, and they either understand or know some words or phrases in Spanish uh, because their parents speak Spanish or their grandparents or other relatives at home. So Spanish, the Spanish language is very dear to them is part of their identity. So we have a lot of people who consider themselves heritage learners of Spanish in San Luis Valley. So the valley and the Spanish language that is spoken in the valley has been in the news in the last years. Um, why? Because it's considered a unique type of Spanish but also because a lot of people are worried, a lot of speakers of the Spanish from the Valley are worried that it is disappearing. That unique type of Spanish is disappearing because many people, especially from younger generations, do not want to speak it. They do not want to learn it, or if they already know, they're afraid of speaking it um, with their friends or at school or the university, or even in the community. So before we talk a little bit more about this type of Spanish, I would like to do an activity, and Rhonda is helping me distribute this. Um, we're gonna do an activity, so please, at each table, make sure we have at least one person who speaks or understands Spanish. Okay, so if you need to move around, please move around, but for this activity we have a handout that is going around. For this activity we have a list of words. So please make sure at your table you have at least one person or two who speaks Spanish or understands Spanish. We have some pencils also going around. So in your group, so you're going to get at least one of these sheets that has a list of words that are part of the dialect or variety of Spanish that is spoken in the valley. So at your table, please give the English equivalent or definition of that word or expression. So if you don't speak Spanish, please feel free to ask. And if you speak Spanish or understand or can kind of guess what that word means or that phrase means, please share it with the others in your table. So I'll give you about 10 to 12 minutes for this activity.
Please also feel free to add new words or phrases that maybe you know that are not on that list. Feel free to add those also and to share them with the other people in your face.
table and sharing your definitions with the people at other tables. Um, 
or perhaps their parents or grandparents were punished if they spoke Spanish at school or with other people in the community. So it is a variety of Spanish and I tell my students we have what we call the Spanish speaking world and the Valley community is part of this Spanish speaking world. So when I teach in my classes the first days, I ask them, where is Spanish spoken? So my students mention several countries. Um, so for example, they mention Mexico, they mention Spain, several countries. And then I ask them, how about the US? Some of them mention New York, Florida, Texas, but rarely they mention Colorado, and the valley, rarely. And when I ask them, how about the valley? Do people speak Spanish here in the valley? How about Colorado? Have you heard Spanish? They say yes. That's also part of the Spanish speaking world. And I make sure they feel proud if they speak Spanish or understand Spanish or lived in this world or community, Spanish-speaking community, I make sure they feel proud of it, of their identity. Because as we know, language is part of our identity. Um, so as you were doing the activity, which words were easier to guess or to get the meaning from? Spanish ones, because of English, right? Um, and the Spanish that is spoken in the valley, is it the Spanish that came from Spain many centuries ago? Is it a changed version? Is it a combination of words? How about pure Spanish? Is there a pure Spanish in the Spanish speaking world? Not even in Spain. And that's what I tell my students, not even in Spain. Did you notice that in this list, there are some words that came from Arabic, from the Arabic language? Yes. And these are words used in Spain nowadays, in other countries, other communities, in the Spanish-speaking world. Can you tell me which words those are that came from Arabic? Algodón. Algodón. Very good. Albañil. Yes. And what's algodón? Cotton. Albañil. Construction worker. Yes. Um, so many of these words that start with al came from Arabic. So even Spanish, the one that is spoken in Spain, is not a pure language. Like doc Dr. Rubadoneda said earlier, languages are not static. They are evolving, right? And they are in contact, even more nowadays, they are in contact with other languages, native languages and languages of people who migrate, who bring with them their own language. We see this in the valley too. We have a Guatemalan community whose first language is Cancobal. It's not even Spanish. Spanish is their second language. So to them, Spanish is in contact at home. Spanish is in contact with Cancobal. And then when we go to school, when they go to school with their friends or the community, they also have those languages that are in contact with English. And as I tell my students, we're getting a lot of immigrants from other parts of the world and many Spanish-speaking countries, from South America, for example. A lot of people from Venezuela who are coming from Ecuador, from Peru. So it's good to know also what, for example, guajolote, right, or elote, right, um, these words are in these other countries. 
because soon they will hear people use these other varieties also. So I tell them, we have a variety, yes, and it's not very different from what we use in other countries, but it's also good to know for everybody, for everybody, to know what other words are used in other countries. Because more people are traveling nowadays, right? And many people are going to Spanish-speaking countries also on vacation or to learn about other cultures or to practice the language. So did you also notice that there is the influence of Nahuatl? In which words, for example? Elote, guajolote, yes. Do you think there is the influence of Native American languages? Yes. Of course. How about English? We talked about this, right? The ones that were easier to guess. And it's not wrong. Those words are not wrong. Right? They are not wrong. Again, languages are constantly evolving. Constantly. Right? They are not pure. So what is Spanish to the residents of San Luis Valley? How do they feel about the Spanish language and speaking Spanish? Do they feel that's part of their identity? Of who they are? So I would like to share with you a few quotes from some people. So Margie hit on, and she was interviewed uh, for the news, and she said, we speak Spanish all the time. To me, that's my culture, and I love it. So at this senior center, there's a group of women who get together and speak Spanish. Diane Martinez from San Acacio says, the Spanish language is part of my identity, of who I am. I grew up as a Chicana, and my friends and family were all about Hispanic traditions. I remember my grandparents speaking Spanish at home. Mary Ellen Fleming says that both grandparents spoke Spanish. The language is right here, she said, pointing to her heart. It's beautiful. I love it. Jeremy Cojola said, when I hear my grandmother or anyone else from northern New Mexico or southern Colorado speak Spanish, it feels like a warm, familiar blanket from my childhood. But not all experiences have been good. For many of these heritage learners in the valley or in Colorado, it has been a tough experience growing up. And I would like to share with you a quote from someone, I will name her Rosa, who shared this with me. She's from Kim, Colorado. My ancestors only spoke Spanish. I grew up hearing the language. My grandparents spoke Spanish. My dad was an ELL student. He was beaten with a ruler across the hands and face in school in first grade for speaking Spanish. I was punished in kindergarten for speaking Spanish. She shared with me that she remembers in kindergarten when the teacher asked the question, and she was so excited because she knew the answer. And her answer was, most of it was in Spanish. And the teacher was so upset with her and told her, go back home and tell your mom that you're supposed to use only English, not Spanish, in school. And she said she felt so bad because up until that point, she thought everyone spoke like her. Everyone spoke Spanish, and it was bad to speak Spanish. But after that day, she felt it was something dirty. So she went home, and she grabbed the Clorox that her mom had for to wash the white clothes, and she put that in the bathtub so she would bathe with that and clean herself and remember not to use Spanish at school to become more white. She also said, for so long, I denied my identity to not be ridiculed and belittled in elementary, middle, and high school. 
When I entered college, I had a cultural identity crisis and wanted to learn the language of my parents, grandparents. Ironically, I was ridiculed for being Hispanic and not speaking Spanish. So I enrolled in every Spanish class so that I would learn to read and write my own language. I became an exchange student in Mexico, and the first thing I did when I returned to Colorado was travel to my grandmother's house where I communicated fully in Spanish with her for the first time in 22 years. She cried happy tears. Since then, I've never allowed anyone to take away my language ever again. And I have heard a similar story from my students um, who are also community members sometimes. And it's sad uh, to not only know that this happened in the past, but to know that this affected several generations. Not only that generation, but several generations because these grandparents or parents were afraid of teaching the kids, the younger generations the language that was part of their identity, part of who they are, part of their family traditions, customs. So let me talk about how we are em embracing cultural identity in the San Luis Valley. So, you know, I teach at Adams State University and we are a Hispanic survey institution. Um, but we are not doing this alone. It's impossible to do this alone. It takes a village, right? Um, so we are partnering with the community. So not only with organizations in Adam State at the university. So we're working, the Spanish programs working with the administrative office. We're also uh, working with Title V. Thank you so much for your support. Um, Spanish Club. We have a cultural awareness and student achievement center called CASA, where students can go and feel safe. And also throughout the university, I will mention uh, a little bit more about what we do to make students and people in the community feel that they have a safe space where we embrace culture, we embrace the Spanish language. Um, we also have the support of CAMP, the College Assistance Minor Program. But like I said, we also have community partners like El Llamado Hispano, the Valle de San Luis, the Chamber of Commerce, Colorado Welcome Center at Alamosa, Radio Stations, Young Professionals of Alamosa, Trinidad State College, and also the Museum, Mr. Carpio, you're here. Thank you so much for your support to the Museum uh, for Garland and also the museum in the Norte. So how do we embrace that cultural identity? Providing opportunities for people to feel safe, to feel that we appreciate and value their culture, and provides opportunities and spaces for them to use the language, the language they learned from their parents, grandparents, community. That is not bad to use the Spanish language. It's not bad to talk about culture and to celebrate all of these elements of culture and of identity. So what we do with the Spanish program, for example, is we have language day, which happens in the spring. So we invite high school students from Spanish classes from the Valley to come and use the language, use the Spanish language to participate in different competitions and also to perform. So if they know a dance, if they know a poem in Spanish, um, if they can sing, if they play an instrument and sing in Spanish, and it's such a joy to see these students come to this event and feel that they can feel proud of the language they learned, of that part of their identity that they received 
from their parents, grandparents, or at school. Maybe they learn Spanish at school, right? Um, to feel good about it. So we provide that space, and of course, we also collaborate with other organizations at, at the state and in the community. We also have Hispanic Heritage Month, and this year, we're going to start San Luis Valley's Got Talent. So we're going to invite everyone who has talent and who would like to showcase that talent, either in Spanish or presenting something that is part of that Hispanic culture that they feel proud about. And of course, we're doing this also with, in conjunction with community partners. We have Dia de los Muertos, and we have events at the university, and we invite community members, and we have events in the community. Sometimes we collaborate on cultural events. And there too, we use Spanish, we educate people about, about what Dia de los Muertos is, and we have fun activities for everybody to come together, everybody from the community, not just the university, but everybody from the community to come and celebrate Dia de los Muertos. We also have Cinco de Mayo celebration, and sometimes if one year maybe we did it in Alamosa, the next year we'll do it in another city of the valley, and we'll collaborate and help with advertising, etc. And how else do we use the language? In advertising. So we advertise it in Spanish and in English. Also in our program or agenda, we have it in Spanish, in our posters, in Spanish, in English, emails, in our program, like for our graduation ceremony at Adam State, the program is in Spanish and in English. Um, we also do cultural presentations educational cultural presentations, either in English and Spanish, or with English with some words and their translation into English. And we incorporate these words or phrases that are unique to the valley as well. So people who are not familiar or do not know these words or phrases will learn it. And our view book is this year also in Spanish. And so, what else do I do? So as, a, as an educator, I have a big responsibility. And I know we have some educators here too. So not just administrators, but also educators. We have a huge responsibility. So what do I do? So I open classes. So sometimes we have cross-listed classes for regular students, but also for faculty, staff, and community members who can enroll in these classes for credit or non-credit. Um, either to learn basic Spanish from zero or a conversation class so they have an opportunity if they already speak Spanish or some Spanish they can come and communicate in the language that is dear to them and we have a lot of people who before felt afraid of using Spanish because either they were punished or their parents were punished, or grandparents were punished, they feel that they have finally this opportunity in which they can not only share with their peers the words they know, the expressions they know, they can have fun with it, but also they feel safe to talk in Spanish. And that that Spanish is not seen as archaic or wrong, but a beautiful variety of Spanish. And if they use those words and phrases, people won't look at them, like other Spanish speakers won't look at them like, what are you saying, right? That they can always, if the other person doesn't understand, they can always guess from context or ask. We do that all the time, right? So even in the US, um, using English, we move from one region of the US to another, right? And there might be differences in words we use, right? The East Coast, the West Coast, the South, the North, right? And if we don't understand something, what do we do? We ask, right? Either we get from context or we ask, and it's okay. 
And we can do the same thing in Spanish. So uh, um, in basic Spanish, for example, I have a student who came to me last semester and he said, Professor Ramirez, I, want, I really want to learn Spanish. Um, but I'm afraid. Because I can understand when people talk. Because I used to hear my father and grandparents use it. So I can understand. I can guess. But I'm afraid I will make mistakes and people will not understand me. And I don't think I can ever learn Spanish. But I really want to learn. And he said, I want to learn because one day I want to be able to talk to my father and my grandparents in Spanish. And he's going to take Spanish this semester. So I'm really glad he decided to do that. But he was so afraid to take that step. So as educators, as administrators, as community members, we have a responsibility right, to provide that safe space and to not Whenever somebody talks to us in Spanish, do not look at them like, what are you saying? What kind of Spanish are you speaking? No. There is no right Spanish or standard or pure Spanish as some of us were made to be. Right? There are varieties of Spanish. And if we don't understand, we ask. We get from context what we ask. But language is beautiful because it's constantly changing. Right? It's a living thing. It's not static. So I also teach culture and civilization. And of course, the culture of the valley, the culture of Colorado in the Southwest is there. Let me share a little bit, and then you get the time, um, a little bit about um, what I did in one of my classes, literature classes, last semester. So the class was titled Short Stories from the Spanish-speaking world. So in a typical literature class at a university, we're taught poems, plays, short stories, novels from Spanish-speaking countries, from Spain, of course, and from other famous writers in other Spanish-speaking countries. But again, we have a Spanish-speaking world, and the U.S. is included there. Yes? We have communities that speak Spanish in the U.S. So that's also part of the Spanish-speaking world. So somebody shared this with me, and we have a book at Adam State Library, this book, Cuentos de Brujas, Diablos, y Quien Sabe Que Más, by Dr. Luis Trujillo. And so I decided to include some of his stories also in this class. So my students would read, yes, about classic literature and know about these famous authors like Gabriel Garcia Marquez um, from Colombia or Spanish authors from Spain also. But also the literature that has been written in the valley with that version of Spanish from the valley. So let me share a little bit of what the students read. And I did it on purpose. I set time in the semester, enough time for us to read these stories in class and to read them out loud. So students would get a feeling of how these words are pronounced, but also think about, oh, can I recognize, do I recognize that word? Did I hear that word at home, right? Or my abuelita? Or my pa or ma use this word or expression? Did I hear this? And if not, learn what it means, right? I'm going to read a little bit. So the title of this short story is En busca de mi apa. Allá por el año del 83, en el estado de Colorado, Cerca del pueblo de San Luis, se alaba una familia preparándose para las fiestas de Santana, que se celebran todos los años con unas festividades que da gusto. So, what do we see here? Colorado, right? 
Pueblo de San Luis. Something my students can relate to, right? No. Uh, las fiestas de Santa Ana. Yes? So let me continue. Comenzó el día como siempre. Todos se levantaron con hambre y querían ser servidos primero. Esta mañana llegó Joselito primero a la mesa y al desayunar le preguntó a su mamá, Amá, ¿por qué yo no tengo a pa como Luis el Chato? Sí tienes a pa, pero ahora no está aquí. Hace mucho tiempo que se fue para la sierra y todavía no vuelve. ¿A cuándo volverá? Preguntó Joselito a su mamá. No te fijes, hijito mío. Volverá un día de estos y te traerá un conejito pardo para que juegues. Pero la pobre madre suspiró y se dijo para sí, ojalá que vuelva esta vez y no se tarde como la última vez. Yo le daría lo más precioso que tengo al que me lo volviera. Mientras Joselito oía a su mamá decirse esto, se puso a pensar, ¿qué será lo que mi mamá tiene que es precioso? ¿Será el túnico colorado? ¿Las chinelas altas? ¿Qué podrá ser? Por fin, después de ver por toda la casa y no hallar nada que pudiera ser precioso a su mamá, pensó, Seiga lo que seiga, si ella quiere darlo, de seguro que quiere mucho a mi papá. Como el más grande de la casa, tengo que hallarlo pronto. So I had one student, a heritage learner, who had not heard some of these words. But when we read it out loud, so it was his turn to read one of the paragraphs. It was hard for him, so we pronounced it together, and then he read it. And after that, he said, oh yeah, I recognize that word. Yeah. Um, so he learned some of these words that are used in the valley. And there were other students who were familiar with this uh, version or variety of Spanish. And as they were reading, they were thinking about their family, their community, their culture, their identity. Also, I did a project so I use also like Dr. Rubadeneira project-based language learning. So the students in this group who read these short stories work with students in my translation and interpretation class. And we had this project of creating books and audiobooks, collections of short stories that will be published free of use in hard copy, but also as audiobooks. In the original language, if it's not Spanish, so the original language, native language, in Spanish and in English. So we invited several communities, because we know, like I mentioned, we have a Guatemala community, um, we also have a community who are Mexican descendants, but we also have other communities, or people um, whose parents or grandparents or other relatives are from other countries in the Spanish-speaking world. So we contacted some of these communities in hopes that we would get the stories that have been told from generation to generation in the past through this tradition of storytelling, which is not happening, unfortunately. It's not happening anymore in many of these communities because either the grandparents live far away from the grandkids or the parents are too busy or in some cases they were told it's not good to use Spanish, right? So they lost interest. So these beautiful stories are just getting lost with those generations of grandparents or parents. So I asked my students, have you heard this story? Most of them said no. Have you heard any short stories from your grandparents? From your parents? No. 
So that was at the beginning of the project. So this project was managed by the students, coordinated by the students, done by the students, and presented, delivered by the students. So the purpose of this project was to create a product, a real product, that would, would be used by a real audience. So the students in these two classes were together and we were able to get stories from an indigenous community in Ecuador, in the rainforest of Ecuador, and the language they speak there is Quichua. But they also speak Spanish. So Spanish is in contact with Quichua. So we asked them if they would be interested in sharing those stories with us, those stories that they have passed from generation to generation. And there carries a lot of culture in them, a lot about who they are. And two communities responded, and they sent us their stories. So what the students did is they either translated, because we got the stories in the original language in Quechua and in Spanish. But since Spanish is their second language, for those people, there was no punctuation. Um, so we saw how Spanish was influenced by Quechua, right? So our students had to make sure they put the punctuation, but also make sure they could understand the story. And there were words that were sent, even in the Spanish translation, in the original language, which is Quechua. Because those things, that, for example, animals or a drink, a ceremonial drink, they only know it in their original language. If we translate it into English, we would have to explain it. It has no direct translation. Like the word chicha, the drink they have. So even in South America, where we have several Spanish-speaking countries, chicha in Ecuador, in the rainforest, they make it out of yuca, the yucca root, cassava root. In the Andes of Ecuador, same country, they make the chicha out of corn, fermented corn. In countries like Peru and Bolivia, we also have that chicha made of corn. And also in the rainforest, we have chicha, but the version made of cassava root, right? So it's different. So the students were learning these words and about these communities, and then they had to translate it into English and think, is that the right translation? Do I need to ask them what they mean by this? So they were able to create this website. Let me show this to you real quick. So they mentioned about their work, about this project in English and in Spanish. So again, all of this was done by them. They teach the audience about Ecuador. They teach about how they came to create this product. And then they also have a section in which they talk about the communities and they have the audit book. And the audit book is in Quechua, the original language, in English and in Spanish. And the English and Spanish has been recorded by the students. And we also collaborated with other departments, like the art department. So the students from the art department provided the illustrations. So they had to get the stories in English in order to create the illustrations. So this is just something little we did, but it was meaningful to our students. And when we did the presentation of the product, one question that they were asked is, how this impacted you? And one of the students said, after this project, now, I want to learn more Spanish and I want to go back to my grandma and I want to ask her to tell me these stories she learned from her parents and grandparents. I want to learn more 
about Mexico. I want to learn more about their community through a common language, Spanish. And the other students in class also said that the same thing. Now I'm more interested. I would like to do more of this. Because learning about these communities and sharing the value and how beautiful this is and cherish this and embrace this made me appreciate who I am, my culture, my identity, the culture of my family, and the culture of my community. So it was meaningful to them. So we are going to continue with this. So this is also something um, Hispanic serving institutions could do in collaboration with the community. And also we talked um, to people in that community to see if they would support this so we could have also a hard copy. And they were very open to this, yeah, to collaborate with us. So these are just some pictures of cultural events that we had in the community in the Adam State for Dia de los Muertos. So one of the uh, students who is here in one of the pictures, for example, she says that she doesn't speak Spanish, she doesn't understand Spanish, but her ancestors are Hispanic and Native American. And one day I told her, you have a beautiful voice. Have you ever tried singing in Spanish? She said, no, I don't speak Spanish. It's okay, you can still sing in Spanish. She tried it, and so with the help of CASA, the CASA Center, also we provided that space for this student and another student who also goes to the CASA Center, to the Cultural Center, so that they could practice and sing songs like La Llorona in Spanish. And she doesn't speak Spanish, she doesn't understand Spanish, but she sang three songs in Spanish. And not only at the event that we had at the university, but also at an event we had in the community. And about 300 people attended that event we had in the community. And so, at the end, those two students felt very proud of what they did. And very proud of their ancestors, their family, their culture. And we also do this with, I mentioned, Sevillas de la Tierra. We have this um, group of folkloric dance. And they invite people from the community, not just students, but anyone from the community who wants to learn folkloric dance. And these songs are in Spanish. So they are listening to these songs in Spanish and feeling the music when they dance. And we provide these opportunities, not just at the university, but throughout the valley for them to showcase their talent, dancing to songs. So, like I said, there is a lot of work to do and we as educators, as community members, as administrators, faculty staff, everybody, we have a big responsibility. But we can do this. We can provide this safe space like this for us to talk about our identity and language in connection to our identity. Culture in connection to our identity. So that everybody will feel like, if I use Spanish, or a variety of Spanish, or any language, it's good, it's valued, it's appreciated, it's embraced, not only at home, but also in the community. By everyone. And I'm not being punished, for using those words I learned, those words, expressions, what I learned at home and what I feel that is dear to me and to my identity, 
to my heritage. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if we have uh, time for questions or comments. Yes? So I would like to invite anybody who would like to come, because we have the microphone here so everybody can hear you. If you would like to, oh, we have a microphone. Please, if you have any question or comment that you would like to make. First of all, thank you for speaking about the Spanish language in the South East Valley. I think a lot of times, being a native from the South East Valley, um, it doesn't come up. And so thank you for validating our language there. And I just wanted to also say that just within some of the, the words on the, I thought it was really interesting, um, some of the words might even be different within different communities. So for instance, one word like Guajarote in our, my experience, we use that word as like for salamander. So my sister, when she brought her um, fiance home for Thanksgiving and he was talking about cooking Guajarote, she got very grossed out. <laughs> Cause she thought he meant, are they used to eating salamanders? So just like different language, different words, is, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, even in Spanish-speaking countries in South America, for example, even neighboring countries like Peru and Ecuador. Um, when I lived in Ecuador, I lived in Ecuador a few years, and I remember um, I knew that sandalias is sandals, um, and zapatillas is tennis shoes in Peru. Um, so, um, when I was with some friends uh, going shopping in Ecuador, I told them, oh, I'm looking for some uh, zapatillas, right? Tennis shoes. And as we walked by a store, they said, oh, here are the zapatillas, and they showed me the sandals. I'm like, no, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for uh, tennis shoes. Um, so, even there in neighboring countries or within the same country, like you mentioned in the valley, the communities use different words, and it's okay. We can learn from each other, right? And there is not right or wrong, right? Thank you. Other comments or questions? Good morning. Um, I love San Luis Valley. I've been working with the communities right there for the last 16, 18 years. I'm from Mexico City. And one of the communities I work in an Eisen Center. And I love what the Adams College has been doing because uh, one of the class I did eight years ago, this chair, a lot of the ladies from that class, they are, have already received a diploma for this university. But totally by people, totally by people. <coughs> So I, I'm so proud to see them go in these ladies and that small community the center. So you guys do it something very, very good. Thank you. I'm so proud to know that and I'm so proud to know this effort for these ladies to come in a profession. Thank you. Thank you. New Mexican Spanish word for cake was incorrect. And then a few years ago, we were in Peru, and somebody was celebrating their birthday, and our guide said, who was from uh, Peru, said, ¿Y dónde está el queque? ¿Dónde está el queque? I said, oh shoot, that's what we use in New Mexico for cake. So we're more alive than uh, I ever thought. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And have you thought of a, perhaps having a bilingual poetry event in the Adam State uh, University? Yes. Um, so we have a lot of ideas. Um, and again, we are 
collaborate more and more with other organizations and hopefully we'll have more like these events and invite everybody who wants to come in and share. Yeah. Okay. Poetry, literature there. Thank you. We, we have a, an organization, author organization, Latino, that just had a bilingual poetry. And Maria, I mean, Melissa's going to join our organization. Calma. Talk about bilingual poetry. Calma uh, uh, is the Colorado Alliance of Latino uh, Mentors and Authors. And uh, last uh, Saturday or last week, uh, we actually had a bilingual poetry event uh, in Denver at the Denver Women's Press Club and eight poets, uh, they read the poetry in English and Spanish and it was a success. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. I think that's awesome. I'm going to come over here in case. Go ahead. Yes. And again, those of us who teach Spanish, and we teach literature or just the Spanish language, we could use some of these poems, right? This literature, bilingual literature that is written here in our communities. We can incorporate those in our classes. Yes? Hi. Yes. Um, um, so what I'm going to walk away with is the, one of the main things that stuck to me that Language is changing. And I uh, looked at the word list and I was seeing, well, there's you know, formal, uh, informal, Spanish, and some words that I haven't even heard of. And so that was an interesting concept. And it you know, made, made me think, well, yeah, you know, Spanish uses different words. And, say different towns, uh, communities in. So for me to keep on learning, uh, like uh, not to judge, like oh my that's not verbal Spanish. So you know that was interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I yes. don't I don't like guacamole, but I like gun so <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and it's good to provide that space too. Uh, not only in our classes, but also at our events in the community for people to share and to learn from each other, right? Like these words, like Ganso, right? Powell. Okay, one more question and then we gotta get moving. In your research, have you heard of organizations that back in the 30s would help monolingual Spanish speakers with teaching three and four year olds their ABCs and their one, two, threes? In the valley? In the San Rose Valley, yes. Yeah, no, no. Wow. Uh, that's, that's, so they were monolingual Spanish speakers who were teaching that. Thank you for sharing that.